So in the last video, we covered the fact that SN1 is a stepwise reaction. The leaving group is going to leave before the nucleophile attacks. So these are a little bit more complicated than SN2 reactions, just because there are several things that you need to pay attention to that you don't necessarily need to look at for SN2 reactions. So stepwise, leaving group leaves before nucleophilic attack. So what this means is that the leaving group is gonna leave and that's going to leave us with a carbocation on our molecule. And because we have that carbocation, that is one thing we need to pay attention to for SN1 reactions specifically. Do we need to do a carbocation rearrangement? So, always always look for I'm going to put C plus for carbocation rearrangements. Always look for carbocation rearrangements in SN1 reactions. So with this being said, let's look at stereochemistry actually. We're going to jump down to stereochem while we're talking about carbocation rearrangements. If we have a molecule that looks like this, our chlorine being our leaving group, we know that it's going to leave before the nucleophilic attack happens. So this is its own step, unlike SN2. When that happens, we're left with that carbocation. So we're always gonna look for a carbocation rearrangement. In this case, it's already tertiary. But the point of this part is the stereochemistry. So one thing to note about the stereochemistry when you have a carbocation is that this right here is planar, it's linear. There's no chirality to a carbocation. So that means our nucleophile can attack from basically either side of this electrophile. So instead of just attacking one side um, it's going to attack either side. And this is going to leave us with a racemic mixture. Or this means a 50-50 split of R and S. You're not going to be flipping the stereochemistry like we did in SN2. You're gonna get both stereoisomers as your products. So now we're gonna talk about the electrophile of an SN1 reaction. So in the last video, we talked about primary versus secondary versus tertiary electrophilic centers. We established that SN2 reactions preferred to have a primary electrophile. Different for SN1, SN1 prefers a tertiary electrophile. So this means it's going to be similar to the example I had down here. Our electrophilic center right here, it wants to have three other carbon groups attached to it. That makes this electrophile um, tertiary. Another big difference between SN1 and SN2 is that SN1 reactions don't necessarily have to have a strong nucleophile. A lot of the times you know it is an SN1 reaction because it has that tertiary electrophile and it might have a weak nucleophile. SN2, however, has to have that strong nucleophile for the reaction to take place. So that is another big difference to look at. So, it can have strong or weak nucleophiles. So now we're going to take a look at the mechanism of an SN1 reaction. There can be several more steps in an SN1 reaction usually than an SN2 reaction, but it's still going to have the two major steps, 
leaving group is going to leave and the nucleophile is going to attack. So keeping everything that we talked about earlier in mind, we have right here a tertiary electrophile and we have a weak nucleophile. So we know that this is probably going to favor SN1 over SN2. So in this case, we have a good leaving group. So our bromine is gonna take off. It's gonna leave. And that's going to leave us with a carbocation, luckily for us, on a tertiary position. This won't always happen. So this is where we would check for a carbocation rearrangement. We checked, we don't need to do it for this one, so we're good. The next step is that our nucleophile is going to attack. So our nucleophile is H2O, which looks like this. So the electrons of the nucleophile are gonna come over here and they're going to attack the electrophile. When we do that, we are adding the H2O, but remember, we're adding the whole molecule. This isn't a salt. We can't break it up into its pieces and just have OH as our nucleophile. H2O has covalent bonds. So anything that's a weak nucleophile is not going to break up as if we had a salt like NaCl or something like that. So that oxygen took both of its hydrogens with it. It still has a lone pair left, and that's going to give our oxygen a positive charge. We don't really want to leave it like this, though. We want to somehow get rid of that positive charge on the oxygen. So the way we're going to do this is we're going to have a proton transfer. So we have water as our reagent. We know that water can also act as a base. So we're going to use that water and we're going to use it to grab one of the protons off of our new substituent because by taking one of these protons and donating the electrons back to the oxygen, that'll get rid of the positive charge on the oxygen. So the base grabs the proton. The proton donates its electrons back to where it came from. And that is going to leave us with just an OH group that we substituted for. So our next reaction, this one starts out a little bit different. One thing that you need to note is that OH is a really bad leaving group. So in number one, we talked about how we wanted to get our water to become OH. That's because this is a lot more stable than water. So we're basically gonna do the exact opposite of what we just did for this one. Because OH is a bad leaving group, we need to protonate it. We need to give it another proton so that way it can leave more easily. So usually, if you need to do this step, you are going to have whatever your nucleophile is plus water. Because water is a good acid or base, you can use it in several different ways. So the first step is that we want to protonate this OH. So in this case, OH is going to be our proton acceptor, which means it's our base, which means water is the acid in this case. So our oxygen is going to reach out, grab the proton from the water. The water is, or sorry, the proton is going to donate its electrons back to the oxygen. This step right here has to happen before that OH can leave. Because this is more unstable, this is a better leaving group than just an OH. So now step two, we're going to have our leaving group leave. We have a carbocation, so what do we need to check for? A carbocation rearrangement. In this case, again, we have a tertiary carbocation, so we don't need to do an arrangement. In some cases, you will have to, though. So next, we have our nucleophilic attack. 
So you have MeOH as your nucleophile, and this actually looks like OH with a methyl group attached. Me just means methyl, so this right here is a CH3. So again, because this is a weak nucleophile, this whole thing is the nucleophile. The whole thing is going to attach. So we're going to attack the electrophilic center. And that is going to put your oxygen directly attached. Your oxygen is still attached to a hydrogen, and it's still attached to your methyl group. So with that being said, we're in the same situation we were in example number one. We have a positively charged oxygen. And the way to get rid of this again is to deprotonate that oxygen. So in this case, we actually had five steps. We had a proton transfer, the loss of a leaving group, your nucleophilic attack, your possible carbocation rearrangement we checked for, but we didn't need to do it this time and then another proton transfer at the very end. So we're gonna use water again, because water again acts as an acid or a base. We're gonna have our water. In this case, it's acting as a base. It's going to accept that proton. So our water grabs the proton. The proton donates its electrons back to where it came from, and so, we're out of room here, but our final answer is going to be the oxygen with the attached methyl group. We got rid of that hydrogen and then the rest of the molecule. So something to note for both of these, since we talked about the carbocation, meaning that the products are going to be racemic mixtures, that's basically saying we have no stereochemistry in our products. And by writing just straight lines, even if there is technically a chiral center, if you just draw straight lines, this is showing that it's both stereoisomers. Or if you're not comfortable with that, you can always write plus enantiomer. And that's saying here is our product but the enantiomer of it is also our product. Same thing down here. Here's our product, and also it's enantiomer. Both of these are our products. So there's gonna be another video over comparisons of SN1 versus SN2. This is something that a lot of people get tripped up on. Um, so it's just gonna go over the basic concepts we already talked about, but basically creating a chart that compares both of them. I hope you found this video to be really helpful. The concepts and information presented in these videos will be true no matter what organic chemistry one class you are taking. However, the concepts presented in this video are referencing material currently covered in Baylor University's coursework. Remember, if you are a currently enrolled Baylor student, we offer free tutoring services. Our tutoring center is located on the first floor of the Sid Richardson Building. You will find all the details you need about these services on our website, www.baylor.edu tutoring. You may schedule a free 30-minute one-on-one tutoring session online or just drop in during any of our open business hours. For more information about our current services, please visit our website. Thank you.